Amen. So Galatians chapter 1, part 2. So we're going to have a little bit of a different Bible study through the short uh, book of Galatians. We're going to leave no um, stone unturned. We're going to look at um, every detail of these chapters and try to gain um, as much uh, knowledge as we can from these chapters in the Bible. So we looked in the first part, in the first sermon on Galatians chapter 1, we focused mainly on Paul. We preached verse by verse through Galatians chapter 1, and I looked at, you know, kind of the origins of Paul, the salvation of Paul, how Paul was born again, and looked at, you know, the results of Paul being saved, which, you know, I mean, if we can look at the spectrum of people um, who get saved, Paul is the extreme, boy, if, if only people that get saved all turned out like Paul, would this world um, be a different place? Instead, you know, most people unfortunately get saved and, and don't fulfill, you know, that, that second victory like we talked about on Sunday morning. So we looked at Paul. We looked at his salvation and, you know, how, you know, even with Paul's past that, you know, God was glorified in Paul's past. God was glorified through that because, you know, somebody with such a horrible past could turn out into be such an apostle uh, for Jesus Christ is really an encouragement. So that's what we looked, looked at in the first sermon. So in the second sermon tonight, what I want to look at is the actual situation in the church at Galatia. What is happening here? What is going on? Why is Paul um, writing this letter in the first place? I mean, why? I mean, what's, what's going on? Okay, and, you know, first of all, one thing I love about Paul is, you know, Paul's kind of a, he's a very methodical, and he's the thinking man, you can tell. And he first gives a problem statement. Most of the time when he's writing, he'll first give a problem statement, and then he will expound on the problem and give the solution. But look at the problem statement at the beginning of Galatians chapter 1. In verse number 1, the Bible says, Paul, an apostle, not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ, and of God the Father who raised him from the dead. So Paul was literally called by Jesus Christ. We saw that last week, or in the first sermon. And the brethren which are with me unto the churches of Galatia, grace be to you and peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil, evil world, according to the will of God our, and our Father. To whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Now here's the problem statement in verse number 6 and verse number 7. I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. Verse 7, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we or any angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, and so, I, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than you have received, let him be accursed. So, there's two problems here in the church in Galatia. There's two problems. Verse number 7 is the first problem. It says, there are some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. Look, there were people that had come into the church and were perverting the gospel. They were changing the gospel. They were turning the gospel into something that it wasn't. They were changing it. They were distorting the gospel. And the second problem is in actually in verse number 6. So there's two problems. The first one is listed in verse 7 is that someone has come into the church preaching a different gospel, which is not a gospel. And in verse 6 is the first problem. It says, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. Well, I guess you could call this the second second problem. But basically, somebody came in and changed the gospel and then they believed it. People in the church went for it. They fell for it. They were going, or at least they were going along with it, the false gospel. So from here in the book of Galatians, and this is why I chose the book of Galatians, Paul, so he states the problems here, and from here and forward in Galatians, Paul launches into a defense of the gospel. He launches into, in the coming chapters, he gives what is probably the best treatise against works-based salvation in the entire Bible, in Galatians. So that's why, you know, personally I chose the book of Galatians. Now, for, for tonight, just to finish Galatians chapter 1, 
I want to look at these first two problems. And, you know, like I said, this is going to be a no stone unturned study through Galatians. Okay, so the question is tonight, we have two problems. Somebody came in and, and taught a perverted gospel, a changed gospel, a distorted gospel, and then the people themselves went along with it. They put up with it. Some of them even believed it. Okay, so how do we stop this from happening here? Turn to Acts chapter 20. We're going to do some preventative maintenance tonight. Some preventative maintenance. Acts chapter 20. And look at verse number 29. You say, well, you know, what are you talking about? We're not the church at, at Galatia, but look at Acts 20 and verse number 29. And look what the Bible says here. It says, For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. So look, people came in. People came in here in Acts chapter 20 and they, they started, you know, cutting up the flock. They started causing problems in the flock. And then, even in verse 30, of, them, of their own selves, people that they thought, at least, were one of them, started, you know, speaking perverse things. Sound familiar? They started speaking, you know, strange things, things that weren't in the Bible. They started twisting things. Why? To draw disciples after themselves. So you say these foolish Galatians. You say, what were they thinking? You say, this could never happen here. But look, this will happen here. I'm telling you. The Bible tells us that this will happen here. So let me just give you some examples of how this could happen here, and then we'll look at you know, ways that we can prevent this from happening here. So look, I want this church to grow. I think you want this church to grow. Hopefully, the Lord Jesus Christ wants this church to grow. But look, two things are going to happen when this church grows, when people start coming into this church and the church grows in number. Look, we're going to get two, two different types of things that are going to happen. The first one is this. People are going to come here that aren't used to a biblical church. And we've already had this type of thing happen, and it's not really an issue. We're going to get people that come here, and they have a lot of things to say, like, well, you know, at our old church, we did things this way. Or our, you know, our pastor, you know, used to do things this way. Or we once had a pastor that we really liked, and he did this and this and this like this. And, you know, look, they're saying, you know, that's all fine. That's all normal. People do that type of thing. As long as as they recognize that we run things according to the Bible here. Okay, so that's all fine. People can come in and they can have past experiences and they're going to have past experiences. Look, your past experience in a church is not my past experience in a church. We're all going to have different experiences with pastors and churches, good and bad. But look, we are not all going to vote on doctrine here. Okay, we are not going to vote on church policy here. I mean, that is not... Look, so new people are just going to have to grow. And they're going to have to grow into, you know, how a biblical church is run. So, we're going to see that, okay? Those are called, you know, growing pains, if you want to look at it that way. You know, people that come in, maybe they're not used to different things, and they're just going to kind of like... And, and you see it. You see it even with people that aren't used to going to church. They just, they're not used to being in a church. They maybe watch a lot of internet sermons or something, but they get in a church and they realize that things actually run a certain way. There's not much, folks, that happens here on accident. Okay? So there's not much. That's why, you know, people need to, you know, ask and things. But people are going to kind of like, they're going to come into church, especially if they're not used to coming to church, and they're going to hit bumpers. Oh, oh, and they're just going to get, you know, they're going to realize kind of how the church runs. Okay? And that's, that's perfectly normal. That's perfectly fine. And, you know, I'm the bumper, by the way. Amen. I'm all the bumpers. So they're going to hit, oh, you know, we should do this, or we should do that. No, no you know, we're going to be polite. And, but look, it's not like we have, you know, rules and policies and all the things in the church because, you know, that's the way I like it. There's reasons for it. 
Okay, there's reasons for the th way things go here. Okay, and it's protection for the church. Okay, so look, we're going to see that. You're going to see new people come in. There's going to be growing pains. It's fine. It's normal. All right, but now there will be people that come here, the Bible says. The second one is this. They will come in here, and they, in, in verse 30, it says, speaking perverse things. It says, speaking perverse things. Why? Why do they speak perverse things in Acts chapter 20? To draw disciples after them. Because they want people to follow them. Okay, so people are going to come in here, and, and we're going to experience that. I mean, I hate to break it to you, but that's going to happen here. Okay, I can't say that it has happened here. I don't think it's happened here. Maybe I don't, it hasn't happened here as far as I know. But it's, you know, get ready for it because the Bible says it's going to happen. Okay, so look, you need to understand as a, you say, okay, I'm just a church member. Say, I'm just a church member. There's no problems here. But look, the problem was with the foolish Galatians. The problem was with the church members. The church members got drawn away by this type of stuff. So look, there's incredible responsibility on you as a church member. Okay, to recognize the difference between item number, you know, person number one and person number two. You see what I'm saying? There's a difference between somebody who's just, oh, they're just not used to the way things go, and somebody that comes in wanting to, you know, change the way things are, and coming and pushing an agenda on the way things are, speaking perverse things. Maybe they have some strange ideas or some strange doctrines or whatever. So look, Maybe even to pervert the gospel. You say, that seems extreme. But look, we need to defend this church, so you need to be aware of the difference between these two types of people. Okay? And by doing so, by you understanding the difference, we defend the church, and we defend the gospel itself. So look, which is, by the way, under full attack today. Or you say, oh, this, this, you say, this, yeah, give me a break. You're paranoid, you say. How many churches out here have the correct gospel? Do you think that that just happened on accident? Do you think that this, the churches that don't have the correct gospel, Baptist churches, most of them in this area do not have the correct gospel? Okay? That's my experience soul winning. How do I know that? Because I go soul winning and you meet certain people from certain churches and you're like, that church must have the right gospel because most people I meet from there are saved. It's a, it's a fruit inspection, right? But most Baptist churches, people that say they go to Baptist churches, they're not saved. So even Baptist churches that used to have the right gospel, they now don't. Okay, so something happened. Something happened for that to, to go that way, and we're seeing a, an example of it in Galatians. Okay, so don't think, look, don't think that it can't happen here. At some point, maybe even for denominations that don't have the correct gospel, that point may have happened hundreds of years ago, but it happened there. Okay, it happened there. So it's the same process that happened with a Baptist church in Fresno that, that got mixed up into workspace salvation as it is in Galatians. Somebody came in, maybe it was a church member, maybe it was a new pastor, maybe it was an evangelist, whoever, it doesn't matter, but somebody came in, you know, uttering perverse things. Somebody came in perverting the gospel. Why? To draw disciples after themselves. That's what happened. Okay, so look, how do we defend against this? How do we stop this from happening today? Because I'm telling you, if we do nothing, and I'm going to explain this at the end, if we do nothing, this church will go into heresy. I'm going to explain to you why at the end of the sermon. But if we do nothing, this church will be in heresy sooner rather than later. You say, that sounds extreme. That's exactly what will happen. Because it happens to, it's, I mean, look around you. You know, 95% of churches in the area have a, the wrong gospel. I mean, that, does that not worry you a little bit? We should be concerned. We should be vigilant. So the first thing we're going to do is this, to protect against this. We are going to preach the fundamentals here. 
Okay, we're going to preach the fundamentals. We are going to always preach the fundamentals, no matter whether it's popular or not. As a matter of fact, in a week, we are starting a new series on just Baptist basics on Sunday nights. And you're, you're going to be like, you know what? I'm like a super wise Christian. I've read the Bible several times. I'm, I don't need uh, basics. Look, there's always going to be new people coming into the church. You are always, every single year, going to hear sermons on Baptist basics, on the fundamentals of our faith. Always. Because people are always going to be coming into the church. Not everyone's at the 400 level, folks. You know, there's going to be 100 level to 400 level Christians in the church at all times. We must always preach the fundamentals. And I mean, just look, basic doctrines that we believe as Baptists and how to apply those doctrines. I mean, these things, it, it, it will shore up. Look, and even if you're super Christian, it will shore you up. It will shore you up. I need to hear these things. I need to study these things. I need to be constantly reminded. Look, there's a lot of them. There's a lot of them. I could probably preach for 50 weeks on this type of topic. You know, we'll probably end it after eight or nine weeks, but I could preach for 50 weeks or more just on basic doctrines that we believe. Basic stuff. And you constantly need to be studying and sharpening yourself on these things. So that's what we're going to do. And you know what? It will unify us as a church as well if we're constantly sharpening on these issues. So, and make no mistake, folks, we need to be uniform on doctrine here. Okay, but you say, but you, say you know, aren't there things that don't matter? Yeah, there's things that don't matter. But you know what? We're a better church. The more uniform we are, the stronger that we are as a church. You know that? Yes, there's, there's, there's small things that don't matter. Ultimately, ultimately, anything that doesn't have to do with salvation, you could classify as a smaller thing. Ultimately, but look, we are a stronger church if we are together on everything. Right. If we're together, I mean, look, and here's the thing, there's no reason that we shouldn't be together on everything, and here's why. Let's say you have somebody that comes into the church and believes something silly. They believe some silly doctrine that we just, maybe it's something you haven't even heard of or, or whatever, you know, some, some silly doctrine. I can't even think of an example, but just something that's just, it doesn't have anything to do with salvation, like, like, like giants or something like that, you know, just something silly, right? Giants, you know, that, that the giants in the Bible were 500 feet tall or whatever, you know, they just, as they're, they watch some YouTube stuff and they're like, you know, the, the giants are 500 feet tall and, you know, flat earth, that's not silly. That's just like, I never even heard of anything like that before I moved to this state, but um, I can't even remember what I'm talking about right now. I say I mentioned flat earth and I suddenly I just lost like 70 IQ points. I'm all, Arr. No, okay, but let's say that we, we, somebody comes here and they believe something silly. There should be no reason, I mean, from a leadership perspective, that from the leadership side, that you should not be, that I should not be able to, say they just honestly believe something silly. There's no reason I shouldn't be able to just show them the Bible and just explain it to them, and they'll just be like, oh yeah, I understand. Okay? Now look, nothing, let me give you a little testimony here, nothing irritated me more when I was in past churches, even before I was even saved, in Lutheran churches. Because when I was a Lutheran, I was super interested in the details of the Bible. Okay? I, I went to all the Bible studies, I, I read all the doctrinal books on the, the Lutheran faith, man, I was sharp on it. But I had questions, and nothing irritated me more than when I would go to a pastor, whether, whether it be a Lutheran pastor or a Baptist pastor after I got saved, and they didn't answer my question. Nothing irritated me more than that. And I did not expect, you know, any man who is a pastor to be able to just answer me on the spot no matter what. And I'm telling you right now that if you come up and you answer me, ask me a question, there may be a time when I said, and I have said this to some of you, I don't know, I'll have to look into that. Because guess what? I haven't thought of every single question that the Bible answers. Okay, the Bible, look, the Bible has all the answers, but I haven't thought of all the questions. Okay, but nothing irritated me more than when I would ask a pastor a question and he would just not get back to me. Or, I mean, look, you know what it told me? It, he either didn't know 
or he didn't know and he didn't care to find out. Okay, look, I may not know the answer to every question. I have not thought of every question in the Bible. But if you ask me, I will study it out and I will get back to you with a full answer. And I guarantee you probably more than you want to hear. I mean, I've done that with some of you. You've asked a question. I, you know, I, I looked into it and I answered it. And you're like, all right, en uh, 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 enough already. And I'm like, no, but there's more. You know, like, okay, I, I got it. Stop calling me. It's midnight. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but look, that's my job, okay? That is my job is to be able to study these things out and explain things. And, and look, if I can do that effectively, the Bible has all the answers, okay? The Bible has all the answers to every question. Another, it's another miracle of the Bible. Name me another book that has all the answers. The Bible has all the answers. Studying it out, you should be able to find all the answers. But look, and that, and that should keep us uniform on doctrine. Now, ultimately, if somebody, ask, you know, if somebody asks a question and I go through the Bible and I can't find an answer, there's a problem there. There's a problem. It may be that what I believed was not correct and that I need to change with the Bible. That's possible. Okay? That's possible. But the Bible always rules is, is the bottom line. So look, the Bible has all the answers. No other book can say that. That's the leadership side. Okay? There is... Another side, though, if you come and you ask a question on a small thing and, you know, I answer the small thing and explain it from the Bible, it should shore us all up on the small things even. We should all be squared away on the small things. However, there's another side of things. Whereas if you have somebody that just believes something, say it's a small thing. Giants are 500 feet tall in the Bible. All right? and you show them, and you explain what the Bible says about these small things, and they're just like, no, that's what I learned in Bible college, that's what I'm going to believe. That is not a great sign. And by the way, most, I have Christian friends who hold certain beliefs that they cannot, you will never be able to explain to them from the Bible because they learned it in Bible college. I have Christian friends that are like that. They're not, they're, they're saved. They're not not saved. But they just have been in doc Look, that, I mean, the tribulation is a perfect example. You know, is it, a, is, it a, is it a salvation issue? No. But they were taught by someone in Bible college. They were taught by some, you know, professor or doctor of theology or something. And they're just, they're just not going to let go of that. They're just set. So that, look, that's not a good thing. And it could turn into a problem. Okay, it could turn into a problem. Because look, you have a small thing that doesn't affect salvation. You believe it, fine. But then they go around and they start to try to take their small thing and what? Draw disciples after them. Try to get people in the church to believe their small thing. Why? Why would they do that? Well, I mean, it's pretty simple. It all comes from a place of pride to draw disciples after themselves. But this is how a small thing could turn into a big thing. Okay? We need to watch for this too. Okay? So don't just say, oh, it's just a small thing. Look, if somebody is going around and they can't be convinced from the Bible according to the way the church believes and leadership has explained to them from the Bible and they're going around trying to convince everybody else to draw, look, that is a problem. That is where a small thing becomes a big thing. Okay, because it's, it's not the doctrine that they're teaching, it's what they're doing that is causing a problem. So look, just be careful about this type of person. And look, it's always, it's always from a place of pride where they want to show people that they know something that somebody else doesn't know. They found something, here's another one. Watch out for people that have found something in the Bible that no one else has found. I found, check this out, brother. No one else in the last 2,000 years has figured this out, but I got it. You got to watch out for this type of stuff too. Because this is, this is where it comes from. Okay? Turn to Proverbs chapter 16. You will meet some arrogant people in your life. Turn to Proverbs chapter 16. And this all comes from a place of pride. So if you find a person, by the way, that's just super prideful, just kind of, you can put them on your, you know, just kind of be watchful in those kind of situations. But you'll meet some arrogant people in your life. 
I, I'm telling you that right now. Look at Proverbs 16, 5. But just remember that as a saved person, you know, being prideful, it, it works different for you. Look at Proverbs 16, 5. Everyone that is proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. That's not good. Though hand join in hand, he shall not be unpunished. So you'll meet some arrogant people in your life, but don't forget, as a saved person, God hates pride. God is not going to put up with it from you. It's a blinding force. It, it, it's crazy. You meet these super prideful people, and you're just like, I can't believe they act like that, and they think that it, it seems normal. You know, it's a blinding force, and God will punish it. So you're not going to get away with it as a saved person. So, believing something different, back to the sermon, believing something different that is small is not a fatal flaw for a Christian. Okay? But going around and trying to draw disciples after yourself, you need to be watchful. And if you see that kind of thing happening, it'd be wise to bring it up to church leadership and let people know that something's going on. Because it's going to get, you know, that's going to get people in trouble. Okay? Run. Now, how do we handle this? We run the church properly. That's how we handle it. All right? And we take action. This is when small things become big. This is the difference between, you know, every other church and a church that keeps the right gospel, unlike the church at Galatia, is that, you know, you just have to run the church properly, which means you take action when necessary. Okay? And this is the one difference. Turn to Matthew chapter 18. This is the one difference. I mean, many people have never even heard of somebody getting thrown out of a church. Many people that go to churches today, we know that, you know, there's, in 1 Corinthians 5, 11, we did a huge study on, you know, the sins that would get you thrown out of church. But look, just small things like this could actually get you thrown out of church if the Matthew 18 process plays itself out. But look, and we must follow the biblical process. That's another thing. Matthew 18 must be followed. But Matthew 18 and the process laid out there is the protection of the church. Amen. It's the protection of the people in the church. And it must be followed out just the way it is written. Look at verse 15 of Matthew 18. Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell them his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. But if he will not hear thee, then take, it, take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. And if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, let it be unto, unto thee as a heathen man and a publican. So if there was somebody that was doing these types of things, spreading around these little doctrines that they believe, maybe they're not perversions of the gospel, look, I need to talk to that person. I need to talk to that person and say, hey, you know, here's what you're doing, and it's not appropriate, and, you know, here's why, and talk to them one-on-one. -on -one. And then if they keep doing it, I need to talk to that person with somebody else. And if they keep doing it, you know, it gets, and this is where people usually leave. Because if it happens again, then it's like, all right, I'm going to bring it up in front of the church now. Because you're still doing this. And then the people usually leave the church. Which, by the way, I mean, why would you go to a church that was teaching a doctrine that you just couldn't stand? I mean, you go to a church and, you, and there's some small thing, you know, where you just like believe that giants being 500 feet tall is the most important thing in the Bible and it drives you nuts, and you can't stand going to a church that doesn't believe that, you know, the right thing for you to do is not to change the church. The right thing for you to do is just go somewhere else. Go find a church that believes that giants are 500 feet tall or whatever. Right? So I'm sure you can find one. <laughs> I'm sure they're out there. Right? But look, this is the process that must be followed. It's very simple, but it's a way to handle things when small things turn big. Okay? So look, don't think that the, the, the conclusion of the message this evening is, turn to 1 Peter 5.8. Just don't think, don't read Galatians chapter 1 and think, how could these people have been like this? Don't think it can't happen to here. Just look around you and look at what has happened to Christianity in the country that you live in. It is in Christianity in the country that you live in is in shambles today. It is busted up in pieces laying on the ground today. It's a mess today. I mean, when someone says that they're a Christian, you don't even know what that means anymore. Unfortunately, you kind of do know what it means. And it doesn't mean much. 
Because it means that they probably just believe you've got to be kind of a decent person. Being a Christian means that you shouldn't drink as much as the person who's not a Christian. That's what being a Christian today means. So look, it, it, it doesn't mean much anymore. Look at 1 Peter 5 8. Don't think it can't happen here. The Bible says, be sober, be vigilant. Because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. The more effective we are here, the more we grow, the more soul winners we train, the more people we get saved, the more influence that we have on this community and other places, all these things will begin to build on each other and we will start to see these types of things happen. Here. I'm just telling you so you won't be offended when that day comes. Okay, because you're going to see it happen here. And ultimately, they need to be han handled biblically as politely as possible, Amen. but biblically. Amen. Okay, so I mean, I mean, they're bumpers, right? They're bumpers. I mean, there's rubber and it's soft on bumpers, right? But if somebody is really coming at the church, it's going to be dealt with in a biblical fashion. Amen. Okay, but they, you know, they need to be handled. As, as Americans, we're, we're really getting into this idea that any confrontation is bad. And, and that's not the case. Because there needs to be some vigilance in the church. There needs to be defense for the church. We can't be an anything goes organization. And we're never going to be. Because look, there, is, there are forces at work against us. Remember the sermon on entropy? Remember that? Remember how you know, the second law of thermodynamics says that everything left by itself tends towards disorder. If you leave a car out in a field for years and years and years, it rusts and it will decay. And eventually, after three, four, five hundred years, a thousand years, that car will just be completely gone. It will be decayed into nothing. The car doesn't get shinier every single year that it sits in the field. And nobody takes care of it. Nobody puts oil in it. Nobody waxes the paint. The sun beats down on the paint. It oxidizes the paint. It rusts the metal from the rain. Everything gets eaten away. And that car will be gone eventually. That's entropy. The entire universe works that way. Everything in the universe works that way. Your body works that way. Your body, as I'm sitting here talking to you, I don't mean to depress you, but you are literally dying as I'm speaking to you right now. Your body is decaying right in front of me. Your body is in a race. You're 98.2 degrees or whatever you are. Unless you're 101, you have COVID. <laughs> Too soon to joke. You're 98 degrees, but your body is constantly wanting to head towards room temperature. Did you know that? That if you sit there if you sit there and you don't eat anything, you don't drink anything, and you don't add any energy to your body, you will eventually be room temperature. Did you know that? Not in not that long of time. In like a few days, you will be room temperature. You'll be dead. And then you'll decay. Right? Look, I don't mean to depress you, but you're dying. You know how you stop that? You know how you stop your body from dying? You add energy to it. You add energy. You add energy to the system. You eat something. You drink something. Electrolytes. Whatever. You add energy. The church is the same way. If we do nothing, if we do nothing, anybody that walks through the door, come on in. Nothing. This church will die. It will decay. People will come in and they will pervert the gospel. People will come in to attack the church. People will come in to destroy the church. Because that's what the Bible says. It says the, the devil, as a roaring lion, is, is, is walking about, seeking whom he may devour. A church that does nothing. And think about a lion walking outside the church. Think about a lion walking outside the church, and he's like, he's seeking whom he may devour. He's looking for a church to devour. He's not going to devour this one, because we're going to take action. We're constantly adding energy. Here's our energy right here. We're adding all this knowledge and doctrine. And like uh, a lion walks in, we're like, doctrine, get out. We're like, you know, we're not going to allow perversion 
in this church. We're not going to allow reprobates in this church. We're not going to allow people to come in and teach false doctrines in this church because this is our energy and we're adding to it and we take action. We take action to protect the church. But if we do nothing, we'll end up like that. That's how they all ended up like this. They did nothing. It's entropy. It's the second law of thermodynamics applied to churches. It's, it's very simple. With no energy added, we fall into heresy, folks. We'll lose our candlestick. Jesus will take our candlestick away. It's the nature of the universe and the goal of Satan is to remove the candlestick from this church and devour gospel-preaching churches. And that's exactly what he's doing, and he's winning. Now think about this. Last thought. Last thought. I know I'm just giving you a lot of just thoughts this evening, but let me give you one more thought. Satan has a serious advantage. You say, why? Now, let me ask you this. Paul went off to Arabia for three years. He went off to Arabia for three years. Here's another reason I really like Galatians. But he went off to Arabia for three years, and the Lord Jesus Christ taught him for three years. Now, the gospel is super simple. I can explain the gospel to the simplest person in about 20 to 25 minutes. What in the world was Paul learning for three years? Think about it. That's what we're going to learn in Galatians. We're going to learn all the deep doctrine that Paul was learning for those three years in, not all of it, but we're going to get some good insight into what Paul was being taught by Jesus. We're going to learn at how the gospel ties into the Old Testament. And all those things that happen in the Old Testament are just, they're perfect pictures of the perfect gospel that Jesus Christ brought to this earth. Amen. We're, going to, we're going to learn how deep the education that Paul had. But here's the advantage that Satan has. Turn back to verse number 30 of Acts chapter 20. Turn back to verse number 30 of Acts chapter 20, where it says, Also, of your own self shall men arise speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Look, in the coming chapters, we will see what Paul was being taught, some of the deep understanding of the Bible that he had. But look, Satan, to advance his agenda, he doesn't need such a deep dive course. You know what he needs? All Satan needs... I mean, think about the, I mean, just when you're, we're studying through Galatians, just think about the thought and the education on the Bible that Paul received. All Satan needs is a prideful person. That's it. He doesn't need somebody that has all this biblical doctrine and this massive understanding of the Bible. He just needs somebody that's filled with pride. And then they just become a tool to carry out his agenda. That's it. To draw disciples after themselves. To destroy churches. These are the principalities and the powers, folks. They're just prideful, arrogant people that are tools of Satan. That's it. That's it. So we must be vigilant. The Bible is not here for us to watch from a distance. We're in this fight, in this ministry. We need to be careful. These are examples for us. And you all here need to be watching for this type of thing. I'm not telling you to be paranoid and being like, I don't know, Brother Matt said something weird the other day. <laughs> That's not what I'm talking about. Okay? What I'm talking about is just as we go forward in this ministry over the next couple of years, you know, and as we grow, we need to watch out. We need to be vigilant. That's all. We can't, we must, I mean, think about it this way. We can't operate the same as everybody else and expect different results. We must do things differently. It, it's very simple. So in the coming weeks, we're going to dive into Paul's defense of the gospel. It's going to be great. It's a great... Um, I, I encourage you to read... Look, it, it's deep. It's some deep stuff. And I encourage you to read these chapters um, beforehand, before we study these chapters, and then we will go into them and we will, just, we will just cut them to pieces. And we will just leave no stone unturned. And you know what that will do? That will sharpen us. That will sharpen us. We will recognize, we will recognize the beauty of the gospel. We will recognize the strength of such a simple gospel. And we will recognize, you know, when people try to attack that gospel. 
Because there's some really weird attacks. We'll look at that too. We'll look at that too when we start to, you know, there's some attacks on the gospel that maybe if you don't understand the things in Galatians and all the deep doctrines, you know, combined with it, maybe you wouldn't even recognize that there's subtle underhanded attacks to the gospel. It will make us stronger. It'll make us a stronger church. So I'm looking forward to it. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.